Today we're pleased to welcome Andy Gersick of the University of Pennsylvania, and he'll be speaking on courtship signaling in a social context, what flirting may do for birds and humans. Thank you, <laughs> Joe. You stole my first sentence where I say, I'm Andy Gersick. Um, I'm Andy Gersick. Um, yeah, I'm here from the University of Pennsylvania. Thanks, you guys, for having me. Uh, and I'm a doctoral candidate there. I study animal behavior and uh, vocal communication, largely. And I'm going to be talking about communication today, mostly, and especially about sort of communication that happens in the context of courtship. So if for people who are sort of evolutionary theorists, animal behaviorists, people who think about evolution, um, communication around courtship and courtship behavior in general usually falls under the heading of, of sexual selection, which, I mean, I'm assuming a lot of this is very familiar to most people here, but sexual selection just being the study of the evolution of traits that individuals use to attract or compete for mates, right? And um, often, the study of sexual selection and theory around sexual selection is largely concerned with sort of the, the shapes of those traits, meaning the phenotypes. So things like, you know, why is this feather so pretty? Why is this tail so long? What happened to this individual? Um, but when we're competing and when we're courting, uh, animals and humans don't just need to have these sexually selected traits. They also need to use them. So there's a whole set of cognitive and behavioral abilities and traits that kind of surround attributes like these stalks that individuals also need to have and that sexual selection can also be acting on. Um, so in that arena, we're often talking really, we're thinking more about signals and displays, meaning the sort of verb form of signaling and display behavior. And with respect to, to that stuff, um, here are a couple sort of really basic principles that I think are pretty broadly agreed upon in the sort of the theory and the study of courtship behavior. Um, one is that courtship signals, in order to be evolutionarily viable, to persist over evolutionary time, need to be generally honest, meaning that they need to provide the receiver some useful information about the kind of underlying quality of the signaler and that signaler's desirability as a mate. And going along with that, what's going to provide that honesty very often is something about cost, meaning that there is some cost to producing or performing the signal that increases the more intensely you present the signal or the display up to some sort of species typical limit. Um, so just to a couple of them, and it's very possible that none of, them, none of you do. Um, so let's say you are a firefly. The thing in your display that females may be attending to is maybe the, the duration of your flash pulses or the shortness of the interval in between them. And the thing about those parameters of your display is that it takes a firefly who's in generally good condition to be able to produce a series of long pulses with really short distances in between. So your, your overall condition is being evidenced by the structure of the signal that you produce. Or maybe you're a lion producing a sort of thick, dark mane, increases your ambient body temperature in ways that have all these deleterious health effects. But if you have sort of vigor to spare that's allowing you to produce this display in its sort of maximum form, then you're probably a pretty good idea as a mate. Uh, or you could be a songbird like this brown-headed cowbird, where on the one hand, your actual display, the form of your display, does involve your courtship song, some sort of difficult vocal trickery that requires you to be in good condition just to make it. But it may also be the case that once you perform that signal, the better your signal is, the more surrounding males are going to hear it, notice that you're a competitor they need to pay attention to, and potentially be aggressive towards you. So in that case, what you're displaying is not only the sort of prowess to be able to make the song, but also the prowess to defend your right to perform the song. So costs of production, but also costs of performance. So hopefully that's useful, or if not useful, at least sounds familiar. Um, and I hope that those examples um, will sort of lead comfortably in your heads to a sort of third corollary rule along with these two big ones that I think is usually true, or at least we think of it as true, which is that for most of the displays that we think about or study, um, bigger is going to be better. And what that means really simply is that across those sort of wide range of taxa where we study courtship display behavior and courtship traits, um, there's going to be some positive relationship between how intensely you're able to produce the signal and 
how well you're going to do in the competition for mates. So whether you're sort of a long-legged fly and the speed of your display is on display or certain kinds of frogs where the duration of your call is on display or a widow bird and you're trying to make a really long tail, the sort of bigger, bolder, brighter, faster, louder, deeper that you can give this signal, the better off you're doing. So in the context of that general picture of what courtship signals are, are like and how they work, um, one thing that is kind of interesting thinking from an evolutionary perspective is something like this. So this is Don Draper from Mad Men, but it does not need to be Don Draper. The point is that he's a really sexy guy. Um, he's seen someone across the room and he's approached them and he, what he has to say to them is, do you need a light? Because he's from the past and he thinks that you can smoke and that that's gonna do well. Um, but the question is, in light of all the other species that we study and the, what we think about how courtship signaling works, why doesn't he say something more like this? Because the chances are that he is the handsomest guy in the world, and he's pulling down a 60s salary of $40,000 a year, so he's super rich. Um, and he, he has all the attributes that should allow for an incredibly intense display behavior. But the truth is that he wouldn't. And in fact, not only wouldn't he, but the chances are, I think many of us feel that if he did offer this instead of the prior signal, he would actually perhaps become less attractive in the eyes of the person that he's signaling to. So that's, that's sort of something that's, that's interesting to me, why humans have this particular class of signal that is characterized by sort of indirection, covertness, and what we think of as coyness, and we recognize those attributes as attaching to something we call flirting, when sort of for the rest of the animal kingdom, it's really the bold, overt, loud, brazen signaling of the peacock's tail that characterizes quality signaling behavior. So that's something I've been thinking about, and what I'm going to talk about today is sort of a, a theoretical approach for thinking about that in humans, and then some ideas I've, I've pursued in terms of testing the general principles with other animals. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is a social cost-based model of flexible signaling, first in humans, then in others. Because Sort of my sense is that it is really the social environment that imposes the kinds of costs, performance costs, so costs after production, that have forced humans to adapt and develop a kind of signaling that goes more with do you need a light than I'm a sexy guy, let's do it. Um, so what are the, okay, what are the sort of social costs? What kinds of costs am I talking about? Well. You can think about costs as happening in two major arenas. There's the signaler receiver dyad, and then there's the sort of larger communication network. So within the dyad, you could guess that socially imposed costs can start out pretty low. There's sort of the mild loss of social capital, the small demotion that you experience as the feeling of embarrassment when you extend some sort of a sexual overture to someone and that overture is not well received. Embarrassment is a feeling, but it's more of a, a register for the sense that something may have slightly changed in your estimation in that other individual's eyes, and there may be some benefits attached to the prior higher estimation that now have been lost. Um, even within the dyad, though, if you think about it, the cost can get a, quite a bit larger because there are some kinds of relationships, some configurations, where you lose a lot more by making an unwelcome sexual advance than in others. So you could think, for example, about well, leading up to loss of relationship. You think, for example, about a teacher making a bad pass at a student. Within that hierarchical relationship, there's more at stake in floating the idea that this could become a sexual relationship than just that this person might regard you slightly less highly than she previously did. You can also think about relationships, besides loss of dominance status, whatever, that have a lot of benefits attached to them that could be lost if you make an overture, like you often hear people say like, well, I'm never gonna bring up my crush because I don't wanna risk the friendship, which is sort of a common trope in our own relationships, but actually makes a lot of sense. There are friendship relationships that cannot support the introduction of a sexual element that would, be, that would destabilize how that relationship works, and the benefits that go along with that relationship could be lost. So there are, there are things on the table when a sexual element is introduced through a courtship signal within the dyad. The thing about humans that's very particular is that it's very hard for things to stay within the dyad. So if we think about sort of a third party, any, any additional over, overhearers of a signal, it's pretty easy to talk very basically about the sort of 
physical costs that could be accrued if you make a pass at someone in front of her boyfriend and he's the sort of person to punch you in the face. That's an easy one. Um, but there are a lot more and a lot broader costs that you could incur depending on who's listening or even with language, who's not listening. So let's just think about listeners. There's, there's something called mate choice copying. We see it in animals, but some folks have studied it in humans, and it seems like it may hold for humans as well, which is that if you're perceived to have been deemed unattractive by one recipient of a courtship signal, other potential mates in the environment around you may decide, that guy's actually, maybe that guy's not quite as attractive as I thought. So there's some potential loss of other mating opportunities aside from the one that you have just explicitly pursued. But much more broadly, depending on who knows about what you did, there is significant physical harm that could happen to you if you've made the wrong courtship attempt towards the wrong person, and a larger network of allies of the holder of the original relationship decides that they want to take it out on you. Or sort of really broadly, there's all the significant loss of social capital that can happen if you're perceived to have made a poorly chosen sexual overture. And the reason that it can get quite large is because of a property of language called displacement, which is just basically that the information in a human signal, unlike signals in really any other animal that we know about, is not at all bounded by time and space. So if you think about that teacher who makes a bad pass at a student, he may do that in a broom closet in school after hours. That has nothing to do with the fact that the entire school may know by the next day. right? So the implications, the potential implications within your entire social network are on the table when you make a sexual overture, even if you make that sexual overture in private because of the ways that language works. If you're the president of the United States and you flirt with your intern, the implications could be national, even if there's nobody around when you make your initial suggestion. And so I've put you know, all kinds of loss of jobs, social position, network of relationships, even your life, which may be a bit of a stretch, although it's not necessarily a stretch in all cases. This is obviously anecdote and not data. It happened recently. It does have 1,392 shares on Facebook. So, but it's not meaningful. Other than just to say, things happen. And the things that can happen from the wrong, wrongly chosen signal can be quite significant in the lives of human beings. So, OK, what do people do about this? Um, so what I propose is a really simple model. Um, and this is a really simple graphic representation of that simple model. On the x-axis are the potential social costs attending a particular sexual overture. And the y-axis is how overt that signal is going to be. Um, skilled signaling would sort of increase its covertness, move down the slope, as the potential costs attending that signal increased. Right. So just to anchor this line with some signaling that I think is sexual in nature but not flirtation, um, in the upper left-hand corner, where the potential costs are low and signaling is very overt, you have signaling that's not flirting that happens, say, between two individuals whose sort of sexual access to one another is publicly understood and not at all contested. So you could imagine, and I didn't have to imagine this, I have a six-year-old child now, a married couple, they have an infant, one partner says, honey, I'm going to put the baby down for a nap, and we've got about a half an hour, so we should probably go have sex. That is a real thing that happens. It's a sexual signal. It contains information about a mating event, but it's not flirting. It's just information transfer. And it's information transfer in a context where there's very little at stake in terms of whether anyone might contest that it's a reasonable idea. Um, where costs are very high, and you have signaling that needs to be incredibly covert, you could have, say, an embrace that lasts a little bit longer than normal between two people who are married, but not to one another. There might be information in that embrace that is sexual in nature, and it might pass between those two individuals, but you wouldn't call that flirting either. In the middle, where you have a signaler who's cognizant of some degree of social cost attending that courtship attempt, but at the same time wants to convey some information about confidence, intent, value, you would have signalers, I think, moving up and down in this flirtatious region, where there's some de degree of covertness to the signal, but at the, some, at the same time, there's recognizable information being passed from signaler to the receiver. Um, so I'm saying that, that these flirtatious indirect signals do something that make it possible for signalers to sort of deal with the cost in a way that's better if they were signaling directly. So why would that be? Um, for that, I'm sort of pulling from. Uh, work in linguistics 
on, in, on indirect speech, and especially Steven Pinker writes about and gives a really nice example of how indirect speech helps to sort of mitigate the cost, change the cost-benefit balance when a signaler wants to make a sort of risky utterance. Um, and his example is highway patrolman pull someone over, there's some significant fee attached, some big ticket, and what she says is, is there some way we can settle this here, officer? So everybody here knows what she means by that. She knows what she means by that. He also knows that she knows what she means by that. So given the fact that everybody knows, why doesn't she just say, how about I pay you $50 then, and then I'll just be on my way? Why doesn't she, if she's going to make a bribe, and everyone knows it's a bribe, why doesn't she just make the bribe? Why does the signal have the structure it has? So what linguists think is that there's a, a quality of indirect speech that they call plausible deniability, which is basically just that that sliver of ambiguity in her utterance gives her a backdoor, it gives her an exit that lets her get out of some of the major costs that she could incur if she were more direct. There's some um, study of human decision-making under risk from prospect theory that says that human beings make a categorical distinction in their minds between something that's 100% certain and something that's merely probable, even if that probability comes close to sort of 99%. So if you think about what's going on in the mind of the cop when she says, could we please settle this here, officer, the tiny shred of a possibility that she might just be an idiot and not actually a briber means that it's worth considering. Maybe that's what she really is. And that's gonna change for him the value of, say, pursuing her arrest, which in, has costs attached to it for him as well. If he's less likely to arrest her, then she is uh, effectively exposed to sort of fewer of the potential ambient costs around trying out this bribe. And if it works out, great. And if it doesn't, she can just say, oh my gosh, I, that's how they do it in Omaha or whatever. And she's back to the status quo, to the lower cost of the ticket that was where she started in the first place. So if you think about what sort of indirect speech and plausible deniability give to a flirt, you can see how an indirect sexual signal, a covert signal, changes the cost-benefit scenario. If he's interested, but at this point they have a professional relationship, and he makes an indirect overture. If she shoots him down, it's very easy for him to retreat back to the status quo. And there's really nothing, nothing lost. They're still just working together, having a meeting in the office, and he was, thought she might be hungry. And that retreat, that back door, is present in the sort of larger social network as well. If it's, if it's understood that he invited her to lunch, that's quite a bit different than if he had, it was understood in the larger social group that he had invited her to sleep with him, and she had said no. So if you come back to this model, Con social contexts are always shifting, right? We are never in the same social configuration twice, and that means if we're thinking about human courtship, one thing that's true is if you buy the, the very general sketch here, then costs are gonna change constantly. And so what that means is that skilled signaling is gonna be about assessing what the costs are in a given social configuration and pitching the intensity of your signal to those particular costs. So skilled signalers are gonna be in this line, in this region, in a way that bad signalers who produce crummy signals are not. So thinking in terms of that bad matching, poor signaling, over here in the upper right hand corner there's the kind of sort of high cost, totally overt signaling that you, that we think of not as flirting but as sort of boorishness. So think about like cat calling at a construction site where the intent and the desire are completely overt but it's also completely socially inappropriate. We don't think of those guys exactly as flirts. Um, in the lower left hand corner Another kind of bad matching is the situation where the costs are actually quite low, but the signaler is not a very good quarter, and the signals that he may be sending, oh, I did that three times before you guys came in the room. His signals may be unnecessarily covert. So if you think about, say, a shy kid in high school who knows that his friend actually like likes him, just like he like likes her, but even possessing that knowledge can't bring himself to do more than sort of mumble about how they should hang out, right? Like, that's not a flirtatious signal either. And the costs are actually quite low. He already knows from his friends that she's interested. But he's not very good at this yet. But meanwhile, a good flirt, someone who is experienced and skilled, is going to be in here. And that good flirt is going to change the intensity of his signal, those good flirts, their signal, depending on context as well. So you could imagine an attractive young guy might be quite brazen in the way that he sort of flirts with a comparably attractive young woman. 
But if it turns out that he's the waiter and she's his wealthy client, then he might be somewhat less open. And if she is dining with her rich husband, then even if he indicates some interest with a wink, it's going to be a lot less over than, those, than it would have been between those same two people in a different social context. That's my proposal. And if you go back to sort of the general thing about courtship signaling theory that I said at the outset, I still think courtship signals are generally going to be honest. And I think that the costs of producing or performing that signal are going to be a source of that honesty. But I think if you think in terms of social pressures and social costs, it's got to be the case that in some cases, smaller is actually going to be better. Bigger is not always better when, when you're talking about the intensity of your signal. And additionally, if you're thinking about animals that conduct their courtship in a complex social environment where the costs are always going to be changing, it's not just that bigger is better sometimes, smaller is better other times. It's that really flexibility may be more important than intensity. Sort of ultimate behavioral result of competing pressures on courtship behavior may be flexible behavior. So OK, so this model has a couple of predictions for what you might expect to see in human beings. Um, you would expect that flirts change their style in response to context, that they don't just do the same thing over and over again, that the signals that people issue to the same potential receiver in different social contexts are going to be different. Um, and you might also predict that the better signalers, the more successful meters, um, the more experienced quarters, are going to be better at making that match, at sending really appropriate signals. I think that these are reasonable predictions, and I think that they are testable predictions. Um, but for people here or people at UCLA who study humans, I think a lot of folks would agree that they are hard predictions to test in people for the same reasons that I expect to see this behavior, that basically social environments, human social environments are so complex and so changeable, and that also the kind of intensity gradient of human courtship signals is, is so changeable that it would be hard to think about, or at least challenging, to think about what the experimental design would be where you felt like you had adequately quantified important, relevant social costs and then adequately manipulated the quantities of those social costs. So I am you know, an animal ethologist, and I like to think about animal behavior and what I think is nice about this proposal is that in a simplified form, it invites a kind of comparative approach. Because the basic thesis is not that humans are going to flirt. It is that when you have sort of variable social costs in varying social contexts, flexible sexual signaling behavior should show up. As long as, with sort of this caveat, individuals can exert facultative control over the intensity of their signal. And that it's nice because this is a real, this sort of idea provides a real opportunity to look at other species that may be sort of more experimentally tractable and then feed whatever you find back to thinking about humans and vice versa, because it started with thinking about flirtation. So, like I said, I study animals, so I decided to uh, look at flexible courtship signaling in birds, and particularly brown headed cowbirds, which is the bird I talked about at the outset. OK, so this is the, this is the next thing. Um, where I did uh, this, the experimental work I'm about to talk about was at the David White Lab at the University of Pennsylvania, where we had four big aviaries like this. There's a dog for scale um, with sort of large, multi-age, multi-sex uh, cowbird flocks in the aviaries. Um, and in those big flocks, the, although they are enclosed, these animals are, there's a lot of naturalistic social behavior that we see. They are free to decide how to associate courtship and competition happen at rates that are comparable to the ways that the things that we see when we study these birds in the wild. Um, and here's a, just a very few things about cowbirds that I'll try to speed through, but that you should know. Uh, one is cowbirds are obligate brood parasites. So that means that the, they don't build a nest, lay their eggs in that nest, and then take care of the eggs and the ultimate babies. Females lay their eggs in host nests, and then they leave. And they parasitize a wide range of other songbirds. Um, when an, the egg hatches, it's raised by the host birds until it fledges, and then that chick is going to go out and seek out a mixed cowbird flock of conspecifics. So at that point, things start to get interesting from the perspective of this conversation, because it turns out that those breeding flocks are sites of really, really intense mating competition. 
In those flocks, there tends to be a, a male skewed uh, sex ratio. So there's a lot of competition for the females that are there. Females occupy these sort of host nest ranges where they are basically patrolling a set of potential host nests looking for an opportunity to lay an egg in that nest. And those territories can overlap. So what that means is that males are trying, <laughs> males are trying to establish a consortship with a female, but which is a, a good pathway to, some, to monopolizing some of her mating. But the males who are trying to establish those consortships are chasing around females whose territories overlap. So you're competing with other males, even if you're watching this lady and this guy's watching this lady. Females, because they're able to lay and then kind of go right back into the reproductive pool, they can mate serially, and some do. Some females move from one male to another to another. So that means that the males have to guard the consortship they have, but then they also are often trying to pick off sneaky matings with somebody else's consort or with unpaired females. There are other males often arriving who have no consort pair, so they're just patrolling around these different ranges trying to pick off somebody else's pair. So there's, it's kind of like the entire breeding season is an ongoing bird singles bar. There's no slackening of the mating competition and therefore no slackening of the need to court females and compete with other males through the entire breeding season. You never get a break where you got your partner and you can go sit on the nest or whatever. And the main signal that's operating in this kind of intense environment is a song. It's a courtship song. So here's a few things about song because this is very relevant to this conversation. First of all, we talk about potent song, meaning it's an attractive, a potent song is attractive to a female, and you can tell it's attractive to a female because she goes into a copulatory posture, which is a very clear signal. She sticks her rear out, she sort of arches, she's basically ready to copulate when she hears a song that she really likes. The more potent a song, the more likely it is to elicit that posture from females. Um, second thing is that it turns out that males are no dummies about what a good song is. Males we've found experimentally, preferentially approach potent song. So if a male hears a song that is very likely to release a copulatory posture from a female, he is more likely to fly over and see what's going on. Someone is doing a good job of courting females over there. Um, another thing that's important is that females are assessing these songs, the attractiveness, on a best of n basis. So there is some minimum threshold of what is a good song or just simply not a good enough song. But beyond that, the ways that females are deciding about who has the most attractive song and therefore which of these songs are good enough that I'm definitely going to go into a posture for that song is moving around depending on what other song she's hearing at a given time. So a song that sounds really good in this pool of five, in this pool of five, even better songs may be the least good of those five. And the last thing is that song attractiveness to females, it turns out, degrades really quickly over relatively short distances. So the same structure, if she hears it from right next to her on a perch, is going to sound really good. If she hears it from 10 meters away, it's going to sound pretty good. So if you're singing to a female and you're really near her, you are going to sound better than someone else who may be singing a structurally comparable song from a few trees away. So considering all of that stuff, we think that there are, like with humans, different cost-benefit scenarios to signal intensity um, in different contexts. Not, however, the same ones as humans, right? You don't have displacement. You only have signal interception. The information about your song, no one can say, I, did you hear his song yesterday? It really sucked, or whatever. Um, and you have no job. You have no social position. Or you have a social position. But in a simplified form, you still have different costs imposed in different social contexts. Within, just within the diet, if you're seeing a crummy signal, obviously the thing you're going to lose is a mating opportunity. If, you're, if you've expended some energy courting a female, she doesn't like what she hears, that's what you've lost, the energy that went into trying to mate, and you're not going to get to mate. But when other listeners are intercepting your song, there's, there's more on the table. So at the very least, if you sing a really good song, and other males hear it, and they decide to come over, even if you still have the best song in the room, you're suffering at least a delayed mating opportunity. Because now this female doesn't just have your song to assess, she has multiple songs to assess. So you may have to continue to stay there and sing to her for at least a while and put whatever energy into that courtship and not be courting someone else because now you're competing directly, even if you win. You could also lose. You could lose because another male comes over, he heard your great song, and he sings an even better song. You could lose because a male comes over who's bigger and stronger and a better fighter than you. And 
in the worst case scenario, you could lose and lose your reproductive capacity because a male comes over, he's a better fighter than you, and he engages in a direct physical conflict with you and harms you in some way so that you're not going to be courting any females after that. So given all of that, we think there are at least two reasonable social contexts that are distinctly different in terms of the costs and benefits of sending a high intensity signal. Down here, where you're alone with a female, it's just you and her, and everybody else in the breeding flock is somewhere around, but not right there with the two of you, it might be nice to sing a just good enough song. Sexy enough to get over that minimum threshold and possibly elicit a posture, not so sexy that from 10 meters away, it still sounds good enough that it's worth coming over and checking out what's going on if you're another male. On the other hand, as soon as another male arrives, if you are physically strong enough to defend your right to sing at all, and if you're not, you should just leave, then you want to sing the best song you could possibly sing, because the only way you're going to win in the song competition is if you're singing the best song that this female is hearing. So we created an experiment to kind of replicate those two conditions to see if males could actually alter the intensity of their signal and if they would. So we built this thing that we called the Octomom because the Octomom was in the news around that time. Uh, and we were dealing with eight chambers, um, although there's a ninth chamber with a female in the center. So there's males all around, the, all around the rim. There's a female in the middle. And the thing about this enclosure is that these barriers are set up such that when all the barriers are in place, all the males can see the female, but they can't see any of the other males. And the female can see all the males. So in this, in this sort of all barrier state, it seem you have exclusive visual access to the female if you're a given male. This is the female's eye view. Those barriers on around the edge, however, are removable. So when those barriers are down, you can see just your adjacent competitor. You can hear their other male singing around you, but you can see one other male plus the female. So like here's what we call the alone condition. This is the from the female. You can see this guy over here actually has his wings spread, he's singing to that female on that perch who's come over to check it out, and this male is over here sort of twiddling his thumbs. Um, whereas when the barrier goes down, there's the other male singing to this female. She's come over now to investigate what he's doing, and this male over here is actually doing what we call a head-up posture, which is a male aggressive display that they do. So he's very aware of what's happening just over here in a way that wasn't the case when the barrier was up. So that's the competition condition. OK, so what did we do with that? We did recording trials. Um, and a recording trial was just 30 minutes in the alone condition, 30 minutes in the competition condition. And we did eight of those, one a day for eight days. And then we did a second phase, one day where we did eight successive trials. And during that time, we were recording all the songs that the males are singing at the female. right? And from that, we were able to harvest pairs of songs, one that the male sang in alone, one that the male sang in competition, from each male. So eight pairs of songs for each male, two recording phases, so two sets of eight song pairs, right? And then the question is, are they changing their song? So the second half of the experiment is a particular kind of playback experiment that we call a potency test, which is basically that we have naive females who don't know anything about these males and don't have any social data. They're in sound attenuating chambers, which is a little white box, which really sucks for them. Um, and all they get is that they are going to hear over a series of days these series of songs, one every 90 minutes, starting early in the morning, ending kind of late in the afternoon. And those songs are contain right one from each male in those eight pairs. So over the course of many days, we're alternating the order of play. Sometimes your alone song gets played in the morning, and your competition gets song, song gets played in the evening. Sometimes they reverse, et cetera, et cetera. And then we record the number of plays that produce postures across all these females. So ultimately, we get a potency score for each song, which is basically the proportion of plays that that song succeeded at producing a copulatory posture within each female and then across females. So we have some sense of how attractive it is. And we did that twice. And we don't hormonally induce the females, so we have that means two separate years, two separate breeding seasons, two separate sets of females, and two separate sets of songs, but same eight males. So remember, we had two recording phases. So we got one set of eight pairs of songs and another set of eight pairs of songs, both different by condition. Um, so this is not surprising, because otherwise I wouldn't be here. What is the result of this? The result of this is that the males sing better songs in the competition condition. So. These are the results for the first playback. 
Females preferred the barrier down songs, meaning the competition condition songs for seven of the eight males. This guy, MG, does not know what he is doing. Yes? What, what are the acoustic differences in the songs? Are you gonna get to I will get to that, although that's a really good question. And part of what I'll say is, that's a really good question. But yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'll talk, about, I'll talk about what I think I know about that. Um, but what we know, at least grossly, is that these competition con condition songs are more attractive in a very sort of meaty way. They produce these postures. And that turns out to be true again with the second playback experiment. And again, MG has no idea what he's doing. Um, just anecdotally, this guy, MG, who is our one diverger, um, who doesn't change that this is a very clean, comfortable, statistically significant result, but is this outlier, is a known dud reproductively. So he sings a perfectly reasonable song, but when he goes back into our aviaries and we're running other experiments that are all about social competence and, and he has the opportunity to pick and choose which females he's courting and he's in this entire flock, MG never mates. So I don't know what it is about him. So he's not changing, which in some senses could be viewed as a personality trait or an individuality character. Yeah. And he, his tones are pretty potent. They're not the highest, they're right. not the lowest. They're not useless. So maybe yeah. it's easier cognitively or physically yeah, it may be easier. I mean, well, I would think it would be easier, right? But I think, I think... So maybe in a bigger sample, you would expect more individuals... To opt with, for this easier strategy. Yeah, it's possible. But I think it represents lower competency, which turns out to, you know, A, B, just at a very simple level, less attractive, at least as far as just at the level of the song. Um, but B, just with respect to MG, which who knows what that really means, turns out not to work out very well. Um, or didn't work out very well for him. But you're right. I mean, once you, so once you put this stuff back into the, the complexity of a real, of a, a naturalistic social context, how yeah, this is going to play out. Yeah. And one of them could be fixed, changing. The other could yeah. be dynamic. Sure. Um, this is just saying what I already said, basically, that they do what we thought they would do. And this is also saying what I already said, they, that it seems like they have what the, the basics, not to flirt, but just to exert facultative control over the, the intensity of their signal and that they do it, right? Okay, so one more thing about this, right? What are they doing? Um, so here are two songs from ND. He was the one whose bars were really high. He's our sexiest singer in both conditions. So here's one of his songs that I hope you'll be able to hear. Here's his other song from a pair. It's not immediately apparent how these are different. I mean, and not that you would expect it to be, but certainly, in a very gross sense, it's not immediately apparent. And what I'll say, because you're going to say, OK, but duh. No, no, I was going to say that. Oh, you want to hear the slow ones? Yeah, listen to the slow ones. It's better articulated. It's less noisy. It's less entropy. Oh, this is. I thought you wanted me to play this, just because they can hear it better. I, I realized I should adjust this image. This, I wanted to be able to show you the elements of the song, but this is a matter of how I manipulated the contrast so that you could see the structural elements when I was in Raven. There's not, there's not good data here about what these songs are really like. And what I will say about how we then went on to sort of, oh, by the way, so this is the really sexy one. And, this is the not so sexy one. So we took these songs and we put them into Cornell Raven, which allows us to look at all kinds of parameters. And the first thing we looked at was broad acoustic parameters across the whole song. So stuff like if you had an affective idea about what's going on, maybe the males are just more excited because they see another male. Maybe the song is lower. Maybe the song is louder. Maybe there's less entropy in the song as a whole. Um, and we didn't find anything like that. We didn't find any consistent relationships between whole song attributes, stuff like entropy, stuff like amplitude, stuff like where it's pitched, um, and, and which songs were better. We did find one thing, which is entropy related, but it's only in this first note cluster, which makes sense because a lot of times females seem to make their decision about what a sexy song is and or isn't by the time they've heard that first cluster. And there is sort of an OK correlation between lower entropy, meaning that the energy is more focused around the central frequency um, in the spectrogram in that first cluster and a sexier song. So it may be something, it may be that, or it may at least be involved with that. 
if it is there, it at least suggests that it's a relatively precise adjustment that they're making. That it's not just like, oh, there's another guy here. Bleh! That it is only a part of this song that they are changing in order to produce a song that is consistently better than, than in the other performance. So one other thing about this, it turns out that there is a pretty decent correlation between the male's competition condition songs, their better songs, across the two experiments, and no correlation at all between their alone condition songs, their worst songs, which I think may bring this sort of comfortably in accord with the overall principle that I talked about at the beginning of Selec sexual selection producing these intense signals that indicate cost. Because basically there is a ceiling on how good these guys can sing. Their best song seems to be relatively consistent, less flexible. Their best song is the best song they can do. And when a female hears that best song, just like you think in standard sort of courtship signaling theory, she's hearing the product of their general fitness underlying that signal production. It's just that they can turn it down. And when they do turn it down, it's a less reliable signal, potentially, because it seems like it's less linked to whatever physical attributes go into the production of the song. So then you have to think about, like, what can the female actually do? Because if she hears the male singing and goes into a posture in direct competition, great. But if she hears him singing alone and goes into a posture, she doesn't know as much about whether this is a good quality mate, which kind of brings it back to <coughs> the issue of sexual selection broadly writ. Like, what do you do in this system? There are a couple of interesting things, it turns out, that females do do. Females can incite direct competition. By chattering at males, females induce them to sing at one another. So if you're a female, even if you are vulnerable to this low quality signal, one behavioral approach you can take is to get males to sing at each other in the context where they're gonna produce their best song that actually has some information in it. Another thing is females, it turns out, lay more eggs for mates that have engaged in more singing back and forth in front of them. So another thing that females may be doing is that when they get a weekly informative signal that leads to a mating, on the back end, they invest less in that mating than they would have if they had known more about that male. So that's kind of interesting because it sort of points to the iterative nature of the evolution of this system. It's not just the evolution of a signal and a preference. It's then strategies around delivering the signal and then strategies around keeping that signal honest as a receiver. Okay, so, right. Um, so is this interesting? So I had some definite anxiety about structuring this talk this way. It's easy to imagine that people will be at least a little bit engaged if you're talking about human courtship and flirting and you can put up pictures of Don Draper. That's, a, that's intrinsically interesting to people because we're people. So why sort of address this with a little brown bird? I initially just had this graphic under, is this interesting? Because at this point of a talk, I think that's a question you're asking yourself as you're talking, at least in my experience. I do, however, think it's interesting. Um, and for a couple reasons. I mean, one, one is that I think that this isn't really a question about cowbirds that I'm then comparing to a question about humans. It's a question about really what sexual selection is selecting for. Is sexual selection largely concerned with the shapes of traits, or is it largely concerned with the ways that individuals use traits? I guess I should say both. And with the sort of cognition and behaviors that have to surround a particular display and a particular signal. And I think the possible model for humans, and what we found just here so far with birds, indicates that it's possible that in many cases, sort of sexual selection and the confluence of sexual selection and social selection may favor adaptability more than it favors strength and may favor sort of flexibility more than it favors intensity. Not that intensity has no informational value, but that the sort of later stage product of social and sexual selective forces on individuals' courtship behavior may produce a lot of flexibility where often we have looked for just intensity. So that's the kind of thing I like to think about, and uh, thanks for letting me talk about it here. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so good, what's wrong? <laughs> uh, no, so, so the Calvert example mm -hmm. to me looks as though um, when there's competition, mm -hmm. doing a better job. Yes. And Everyone that's not flirting. Yes. Except MG. But your previous example was when there's competition, you get more subtle. Right. And getting a better, doing a better job may be articulating what you're saying better. Mm -hmm. And to do that, um, you know, it's sort of working harder. Mm -hmm. It might be articulation come about amplitude, but it can also come about. Wait, are we a bird? Are you a bird or a person right now? It doesn't matter. 
Okay. Mm. I mean, I'm saying the burning mm -hmm. example because it seems that's sort of the contrary to what you were suggesting, that costs were driving um, more cryptic signaling in a costly situation. And here, if anything, you're probably getting more conspicuous signaling because it's better. Well, Emails like it better, and it's, if anything, it might be that first note cluster might be more articulated. Okay. Yes, you're right. But I think that the, the question is sort of when... It's a problem of complexity because it's when... When will which costs apply? So I agree with you that yeah. the cost should influence this. No, 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 I know. But what I mean is, like, the reason it goes opposite for birds and humans is that, I mean, is that kind it of seems, part of it the... It seems as though it's going opposite. Right. The reason that I would, I, I, I think... I don't see the cost in the, in the, in the because birds. I see the, a variance in the birds as a right. function of social... Yeah. So the cost to the bird, though, is, is going to happen if you allow yourself... The cost to the birds, I think applies at the moment that you sing a really attractive song when you could have had an easy copulation and it brings in direct competition. So in that moment, when, when you're singing to someone alone, you have the opportunity to get a copulation with a lower quality signal. Once males come in, in a natural setting, I think if you can't hold your own in that competitive setting, you, the choice would be to leave. Because if you can't sing the best song, or you can't fight with these other males, because there's a lot of direct aggression, male-male aggression, you should leave. By holding the birds separate, we were basically forcing them into this peculiar social condition, which does exist for some birds, which is that they were courting in the direct presence of other males, but they were in no physical danger. And in that condition, you want to send your best signal because you're only competing on the battlefield of signal quality. So it is a different, it's a, the conditions dictate different sort of investments in signaling intensity that move in some ways in opposite directions from what I think happens with humans. But the point is that it's still a, at a very basic level, I think, it's a question of can you flex the signal? Yeah. And if so, you know, move it in the direction that works. That's all I think. I think you should move it in the direction that works and it's gonna change species to species which direction is a good direction given which set of conditions? I think. But what? Yeah, Brooke. Well, so I think, and I think this gets somewhat dance Okay, so then that means I didn't get to dance points. Okay. Well, no, no, no. It's, it's, like, it's sort of conventional. But, but thinking about this in the cost of signaling framework, mm -hmm. right? Which mm -hmm. I think is laid out quite nicely. But the one piece that was missing is thinking about what the benefit of the audience is, right? Because mm -hmm. that's the other sort of. Oh yeah. There's right. Model, um, and it can't be something that's o that's obvious, right? It has to be something that that you have to. Oh, you still. mean what's the benefit in human flirtation to the audience? Right. Okay. So, yeah. Well, in, in either case, right? So in, with the cowbirds, it seems like so the cost is that you could bring these competitors in and you might risk you know, physical harm or at mm -hmm. least more competition, mm -hmm. right? But for the female cowbirds, the benefit is that they then get to know. It's some sort of indication of mm -hmm. how, where that bird is and the ability mm -hmm. to win those kinds of, mm -hmm. of status competitions, mm -hmm. dominance competitions. Mm -hmm. In humans, right, where you've got this all happening on a more subtle level, mm -hmm. the risk may be things like these social displacement costs. Maybe mm -hmm. those things are mitigated by what kinds of social alliances you mm -hmm. have. Mm -hmm. And for humans, it seems like the, the reason that the boorish guy mm -hmm. is, you know, that's not a good strategy, and being mm -hmm. too shy is not a good mm -hmm. strategy, and you want to be in that sweet spot in the mm -hmm. middle, is that maybe that is proffering information about how you can negotiate other kinds of social situations, right? Well, that is what I think. Okay. I mean, so I, it doesn't meld, so for humans, here's what I think, which I think addresses what you're thinking. I think you're right. Like, I'm saying that there's this signal this kind of signal, which is categorically distinct, it's a flirtatious signal, and it involves this mix of overt and covert, and you're messing with the balance. And I think that the ability to do that well is, represents something that you could call social skill, social adeptness, behavioral flexibility. There are a lot of traits that you have to have to do that well. A boar is a boar, right? You, you, you expect about that boar that he is a cad or a jerk in a lot of ways that are meaningful, that, that connect to all kinds of costs and benefits about that guy as a potential mate. Um, so I think that flirting well 
if it's a quality, if actually flirting well is itself a quality signal, I would think it is a signal of flexibility, of cognitive, of the flexibility, which then can encompass sort of social intelligence, cognitive be flexibility, behavioral flexibility. But that's, that's one, that's a second order thing, right? It's like if you have people, if you have a signaling strategy that responds, that evolves in response to this fluctuating social situation, but then requires skill to do well, then you would imagine that having the skill to do it well could potentially become something that you are evidencing when you do it well. Um, that's my signals, suspicion. But the signals are not necessarily seeing or judging the flexibility, right? They no, see they're the just matching, seeing the matching. Right? Although I think it's two separate things. Like there could be selection on mm -hmm. the flexibility because you're right that you should incur as, as few costs as you need to given the situation, mm -hmm. which is why I think mm -hmm. that explains the females are only, so, and it makes sense that the females would want to incur competition because they want to see the best that you've got, right? Because mm -hmm. cowboys, for right. example. Right, yes, in the cowboys. Well, and also that if it, this is true, that they're really only getting the kind of information you want to get out of song when you're in competition. If you can really turn it down and you can sing just a pretty good song, the best they know about you is that you're not a total washout as a singer. When it's right, so anyway, go ahead. They should try to get the best that's out, right? Because right. Well, but okay, so what do you think though? Because, so I would say a couple of things. One is, that's not, I mean, in fact, in a social environment, they may be seeing, there's a lot of sampling that could potentially be taking place, right? So you may, and certainly in ancestral environments, right? You may have a, a, a long window over which to see how a particular guy comports himself in different courtship situations or how he courts you. Does he, is he, you know, good at making sure that other coworkers don't, catch on when he's kind of courting you at work, but then bolder and, and treating you in a different way when, you're, when the two of you are in a more appropriate situation. Um, so there are opportunities, I think, to census flexibility. And cowbirds, too, listen to a lot of song. Um, they don't, it's not just necessarily. You can elicit a copulation with one song, but there are also, in a flock, potentially lots of opportunities to hear males sing. Um, the other thing is that I feel like females are very so you know the female receiver is going to be assessing the social context as well. So it's not just it's not just the data in the signal that it can that signal can be matched up to the social context and there's there's a lot you can think about is this a good appropriately pitched signal given this environment even in a single signaling event I think. Yeah. Yes no Well, and that's the thing. It's like there are a lot of people here who are better than I am and more experienced than I am in thinking about like how many parameters would you have to corral to say you were doing anything worthwhile with people, and how could you possibly manipulate them to to look at that in a more scientific way than just what I'm doing right now, which is just speculating, right? Ultimately, yes, sir. Um, I thought it was interesting that the uh, the cowbirds mm -hmm. have this. Which is markedly different than what humans do. In fact, humans are more likely to be just the opposite. Mm -hmm. There's a great deal of mm -hmm. care involved. Yeah. Very long costs for yeah. at least for the women. Right. So to get at this issue of flirtation, mm -hmm. that might be very specific to the situations in Mad Men. Mm -hmm. Women taking care of broods for offspring for a very long time. Mm -hmm. The I've never seen the show by the way. I kind of fell off on season four, but it's a good show. <laughs> that the, um, the situations involved have this very special set of costs involved if there's going to be an extramarital affair, for example. Mm -hmm. And the cost.
costs are likely to be a very different set of costs for the companies. Mm -hmm. And that might make them perhaps a good thing for showing that they can be flexible, mm -hmm. but not for showing that they can flirt. So you might need a different species to try and flirt with. Well, I definitely think you, like, if this is a thing, right, then you, I, one, would want to look at it in a lot of different animals. I mean, I think what's particular about cowbirds that's, that's particularly good, potentially, for this question, but absolutely doesn't cover the waterfront of courtship signaling, um, is that they, they are brood parasites, so there's no parental care. There's nothing that the males are offering these females after the moment of mating other than their genetic quality going into that mating. So in terms of the importance of the signal and how well the signal is developed, it's pretty important because if she's assessing his quality via the signal, that, that event carries potentially all the information. There's no, for, there's no ongoing relationship benefit after whatever he's gonna contribute based on whatever he was able to put, or assessed by whatever he was able to put in that signal. So I think it's good for, for that. But I would not in any way call it flirting. It's not flirting. It is flexible, in, flexible courtship signaling involving facultative control over signal intensity in response to changes in the ambient costs as imposed by other members of the social group. That is a really boring and long sentence. So I wouldn't say that, but I mean, yeah, I definitely don't mean to imply, I mean, I mean to allude to, but, but not at all say that hum humans are the ones that flirt. Humans flirt. And I think flirting has a lot of components to it beyond what a bird is going to do, for sure. But I mean, maybe primates flirt. Well, right, right. And, and, you know, there may be other ways to look at signaling over the long term, you know, and ways that, sig that a, a broader arc about multiple signaling events that would say something else I mean, that absolutely that contributes to this picture. I'm only looking at just can you control your signal intensity given that there's so much in the theory and in the literature about here's my really red feathers, here's my really long tail, you know, whatever. And the fact that there's, I think there's more to it than that. Joe. Oh, well, uh, actually I think uh, David. Oh, sorry. Um, oh, hi, well, sorry. between the birds, uh, where you're saying off in that situation naturally where they're confronted with more um, better, better singers, mm -hmm. they would just not sing, they would leave. Mm -hmm. um, was there a period where they, where they wouldn't sing before they learned that? We were... We thought that there might be. I mean, one of the reasons that there were two recording phases is because we there are so many potential influencing factors. So one of them is the dominance relationship we chips between these males. So before the stuff that I talked about, we had the males housed together and we figured it, we mapped the consistent sort of dominance hierarchy amongst the males. And then each day of those eight days, we paired each male with a different male because we were concerned that just gross singing rates might just totally plummet for certain males when they were paired with a particularly dominant male from whom they'd received aggression or, you know, whatever. As it turned out, we didn't really see so much of that. They, we also were rotating females partially because we were like, what if a female seems particularly receptive or unreceptive to a particular male and he doesn't sing to her? So we wanted to give them, we wanted to, as much as we could, give them opportunities to do their best kind of in the face of every possible social configuration we could give them in that apparatus. I would say that they sang at fairly comparable rates at the beginning and the end of these, these periods. Um, but on the other hand, I haven't examined it as finely as I think you would want to do in light of sort of your question, right. you know? Because in the, in the grass, it looked like in the, in the second trial, like all across the board, the song attractiveness went up. Oh, it was higher. Yeah. yeah. You're right. Um, did, and in your trials, did we see, do you think that had anything to do with the receptiveness? Of the so in that case, right, that was all one day. So it's possible that that was a really attractive female or a really receptive female. Um, it's also possible, though, remember that those scores are being derived from the group of females. So it's possible that in the first trial year, we had a group of females that were up for it, but not 
like super jazzed. And in the second trial year, we had a group of females that were very primed to go into postures. And so they may all have been responding at just a higher rate because that's where they were. Because the breeding season, the, the sort of the hormonal load that produces the, the receptivity to signals and the likelihood of jumping into a posture, that fluctuates over the course of the entire breeding season. So if we got a group of females that were really at their peak receptivity, we would see higher scores across the board. But it's hard to tell. I mean, that's why I'm just glad that we were only trying to look at the difference, right? Because you're right, even in this pretty controlled and stripped down kind of a, an experimental setup, there are multiple variables that are going to affect. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah, sure. Ma'am. Well, obviously people have thought about courtship, right? Um, as I understand it, the particular thing that I've been looking at, you know, my, my co-author, Rob Kurzban, he's, an, he's a real evolutionary psychologist, and um, one of the important contributions he made was towards the end when I had a manuscript, he was able to say, okay, but don't forget to think about, don't forget to look at, you know, that kind of stuff from the ev psych literature. But he... He said, and from my own lit review, I haven't found particular looks at signal intensity. There's this thing that you and I talked about before people came, which is that there's this famous human ethologist, and I'm always afraid to say his name, Irenaeus Ivesfeld, someone, okay, who did a lot of uh, collection of video and, and graphic representations of behavior across a lot of different cultures, and he has this cross-cultural survey, and what he says about human flirting behavior courtship behavior, the thing that he pulls out as cross-culturally consistent is the, the attribute of coyness. He talks about facial expressions and gestures and having a sort of advanced retreat quality. And he has his ideas about what that's about. But just at a descriptive level, that was one of the things that I sort of looked at really early on that gave me some confidence that it was fair to say that there's something essential about flirtation that isn't just specific to madmen. You know, it's not just my idea of what flirtation is, that there is there's a kind of behavior that involves the, the indirectness, which is what I was kind of trying to find out about. But I don't think a lot has been done about courtship signaling in this particular, in, in, with respect to this particular thing that I'm aware of. But please feel free to correct me, anybody here who knows more about this literature than I do. I was just trying to think of some you know, possible scenarios or something. Song duels with uh, Nepsilic Eskimos, where you have song duels between men for, and then the, the best <laughs> singer gets the, mm -hmm. gets the woman. And then you have an audience to the event. Mm -hmm. So you have, you know, I want uh -huh. to try to figure out what would be, what kind of speech activities could you be looking at to be able to get this? And, and there are, you know, there, there are people, so then there's the audience, the men that are judging who's the best. So they get some sort of social capital from the, the cleverness of the song. Mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Like one small uh, mm -hmm. semantic shift that, mm -hmm. that, that, that turns the insult mm -hmm. um, to the other party. So I was trying to think of, you know, what could be some context in which we could look at this in a naturally occurring. Well, I mean, there's, I mean, what you're saying sort of makes me think of competitive signaling, which in animal ethology, there's lots of stuff about about sort of dueling, like you know, the sort of escalating contests where. Matching, it's right? Though. Oh yeah, no, no, sure. I mean, for people, Back but even you know, I was even thinking the um, the, the thing of the the men uh, trying something for women. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a that can be a competitive kind of uh, mm -hmm. rhyming event too. Mm -hmm. You know, who has the better rhyme, and then it's mm -hmm. judged by the other guys that are around, but mm -hmm. it's also judged by the females. I mean, I think it just depends on what 
what frame you're trying the, the same behaviors can be meaningful in different ways depending on what frame you're looking at them through. So like all the stuff that you're talking about calls to mind for me in, a, in many ways sort of some form of competition, including fun competition, game competition, and play, but that there's something about pitting a signal against another signal and the possibility that that might escalate and that, you're, that there's some sort of one-upsmanship um, involved, which there is that. I mean, one of the things that I'm kind of saying is that that competitive element is never absent or seldom absent from something that in other ways gets categories, categorized quite differently, which is competing to directing a signal at a recipient that you're not competing with in terms of signaling ability, but that you are trying to show off to, right? But, I mean, you're right. I'm saying that the male-male competition component for the birds, for example, is present in how you're going to deliver your signal to the female, even if the male is not there, and even if what you're doing is singing to a female, not singing to another male. Yeah, no, I think that you're right, that that audience can be an audience that you are competing with, and that could influence your behavior that maybe you know perfectly well as a guy sitting on a wall hooting at someone who passes by isn't going to get you a mating opportunity nine times out of ten, but may be functioning in this other, con in this other part of your social world to do something quite different. I think that's, to that's totally true. Susan, you were going to... No. Oh, okay, oh, okay. Then, yes, sir. Um, well... First, a comment so about the question about whether <clears throat> in other primates there might be behavior that's more similar to human flirting. And the systematic study of variation in male mating effort in non-human primates is something that is just getting going. There's not really a lot of real data on it. But certainly anecdotally, we see this all the time. The low-ranking males will do these very attenuated, subtle signals. Um, so the same kinds of facial expressions or, uh, or gestures which dominant male will go right up to a female and do, the subordinate male will kind of like you know, try to catch the female's eye and then do the signal and then kind of scurry away hoping the female will follow him. So I can't believe that I've been talking to you for three days and you never mentioned that. I'm a little bit... <laughs> <laughs> but again, it's, it's, it's largely just anecdotes. That's pretty. Okay. Um, well, the conclusions will do a lot of approach retreat in the theory, particularly if it's a subordinate male. There is a lot of eye catching and leaving. So in, in, in a solution question, first of all, instead of moving towards one another, they, they always do that, slice and then retreat. They do this real quick, mm -hmm. duck face and the eye, eye gaze, and then they go away, uh -huh. away from the female instead of towards her. And huh. affect the female, actually. Well, that's cool. Yeah, that's exactly the kind of stuff that... I mean, the other thing I didn't talk about is... Because it's like a whole other boring story about me, but like um, another thing that made me think about this was that I spent some time around brown... Tufted capuchin, I told you guys this, but brown tufted capuchin monkeys, which have different signal repertoire from the ones that these guys study, but I was basically courted by a female who I think thought that I was not the alpha male. And so she produced this whole repertoire of, of this is her, actually. <laughs> she produced this whole repertoire. This is how she, she would sneak up on me in the forest when no one else was around, and she would make no sound, and she would do this. And actually, there's an even more intense version where you do that, and then you go... <laughs> And you sort of lean over. And it's, it's very clear. Like, there is a serious crush going on. But she never did it in front of any of the other monkeys. So I kind of felt like she was doing the cryptic version of a, a ritualized sort of courtship display that could get louder and bigger and more public. Um, so it was a little hurtful in that sense. <laughs> what else? Uh -huh. any sensible uh, consumption uh, uh -huh. as a display uh -huh. you know, the, the way someone would dress for a date at pri a, sub a private apartment or at a uh -huh. party would be, would be different. Totally. Of, uh, totally. Yeah. I mean, I think, like, once you start talking about um, changing the intensity of a signal, you, it's, it's easier to think in terms of a signal a, an utterance or a move, but, but really we are, we're layering across a lot of different modalities um, the signals that we're sending out. And so 
that's part of the reason that I think that like the human part is so hard to co to conceive of really good experiments because what do you manipulate? Do you manipulate? Do you have to worry about what the signaler or receive or potential receivers are wearing, or how tall they are, or how yeah sure how many of them there are, but how deep their voices are, how big they are, where what environment are they in a bar or are they at a restaurant or are they at a less explicitly competitive environment like the kids' t-ball game or like whatever it is. There's there are so many things, and I think you're right. Like you people may go so far as to adjust the ways that they speak given how they have dressed given how they anticipated the social dynamic would be so it's i guess i agree with you i guess that's a long way of saying i agree with you okay thanks you guys thanks a lot